It's my pleasure to welcome you to our 2018 Legislative Breakfast. My name is Dr. Ray Comiskey, JCGA board member and president of Jefferson College, and I'll be your moderator for this morning. We are coming to you on KJF Radio, and today's program will also be available on JCTV and via the web on our Jefferson College Facebook page. Uh, before we begin our program, let me take a moment to recognize our sponsors for this breakfast, Govero Land Services, Comtree, Dobbs Tire and Auto, Mercy Jefferson, St. Paul GM Power, Ameren, Customer Insurance Services, Debbie Dunnigan, Recorder of Deeds, Firework City, and Sheet Metal Workers Local 36. Can we give them a round of applause, please? We are here today to talk about the work our legislators do on our behalf. I'm sure, as most of you know, this has been an unusual year in Jefferson City, with the legislative session being overshadowed by a turmoil that plagued uh, then-Governor Greitens and his time in office. On May 29th, the governor announced he was resigning, and Lieutenant Mike Parsons, Parson was sworn in as the 57th governor on Friday, June 1st. In case you don't know much about our new governor, he was elected in 2016 as the 47th lieutenant governor of Missouri, receiving the most votes of any lieutenant governor in the Missouri history. Governor Parson was born and raised in Bolivar, Missouri, in southwest Missouri. He served in the Missouri Senate from 2011 to 2017, and the Missouri House of Representatives from 2005 to 2011. Governor Parson also served as the sheriff of Polk County from 1993 to 2005. While in the Missouri Senate, Governor Parson chaired the Small Business, Insurance, and Industry Committee and served as a majority whip. He also managed to pass our state's largest bonding issue in 20 years, which resulted in numerous maintenance and repair construction projects for public facilities throughout the state, including our library here at Jefferson College. Uh, but we are here to talk about the legislature. So despite all that's going on at Jefferson City, the legislators were busy this year. Uh, the general session saw 2,359 pieces of legislation filed, with 155 bills being truly agreed to and finally passed. Former Governor Greitens signed 77 of those bills on his last day in office. Governor Parson has until July 14, 2018 to either sign or veto the remaining bills. All legislation passed by the General Assembly, if signed into law by the governor, will become effective on August 28th unless the legislation provided for a specific uh, effective date or contained an emergency clause. If the governor takes no action, the bill does become law. So that summary brings us to our program today. As always, I'm pleased to say firsthand that our legislators work well together and work hard on our behalf. It's now my pr uh, pleasure and privilege to invite members of the Missouri legislature from Jefferson County to give us their perspective of 2000 legislative session. Today, we'll begin with the House and uh, senior member, Representative Lane Gannon. Lane? Well, thank you, Dr. Kamensky. Um, that sounds nice, senior member. I, can, <laughs> I remember when I was sitting down on the end as a, as a freshman, and I can honestly ask myself, where has time gone? I have one term left, and um, my district is very, very rural. I have the um, I have parts of southern Jefferson County, northern St. Francis County, and a small section of St. Genevieve County. Um, I would like to thank the Jefferson County Growth Association for waking up, waking us up this morning with uh, the wonderful breakfast and the uh, coffee, and. Um, Thank you, Dr. Kaminsky, for having us back again this year, and a special thank you to KJFF for allowing us to get our message out to our constituents today. Uh, as Dr. Kaminsky just said, Mike Parsons is the new governor. Uh, he is an honorable man, and I look forward to seeing what direction he takes the legislature in this, coming, this next coming session. Um, we were very fortunate this session, despite all the distractions, to pass a lot of good legislation. I served on the Higher Education Committee, and a year ago, Governor Greitens made some really, really deep cuts uh, to higher education. This year, House Bill 2003, sponsored by Representative Fitzpatrick, restored those cuts. 
restoration was contingent on universities agreeing not to increase tuition more than 1%. We fully funded the foundation formula for the second year in a row. We increased funding for transportation by 10 million, as well as money for autism. <clears throat> This session, I sponsored House Bill 1606, which was an education bill called the High Set. After four years of carrying this bill, it finally made it across the finish line. And you have to realize that happens a lot. Sometimes it takes a bill four to six years to uh, finally make it against, uh, across the uh, finish line. So in the state of Missouri, the High Set replaces the GED. So if a student who has dropped out wants to um, get their high school diploma, they will be taking the high set. The tests are very similar, um, except the high set costs $95 and the GED cost $125. So this bill, uh, the, or the intent of this bill is to remove obstacles and increase the number of first-time test takers taking the high school equivalency uh, test called the high set We know that students drop out of high school for a lot of different reasons. Uh, home issues, drugs, finances, etc. And these are the kids uh, who are uh, couch surfing. They're living on the street, in parks, uh, possibly at the train station, the bus station, or they could be in prison. In committee, when I presented this bill, one representative raised his hand and said, well, I think these students should have some skin in the game. In other words, uh, they should pay a certain amount of the $95 to take the test. And I said, no, that's not going to happen. I said, these are the kids, the lowest of the low financially. They have nothing. And they finally realize at about the age of 22, 23, I've got to do something to turn my life around because I can't get a job. I don't have a high school diploma. Um, so I said, if they have $10 in their pocket, they may, they may want to use that for maybe a, a, a sandwich at McDonald's for lunch. They may need a pair of gloves. They may need a pair of socks. So I said, um, no, we're not going to ask them to pay uh, any of the part of the cost. Um, so how are students paying for the cost, the $95? Well, I think 65 is a registration fee, and then there's five parts to the test, and each test costs $7. So a lot of times, a family member, a friend, um, maybe an organization in town will say, tell the school, hey, I want to pay for three kids this year, three students uh, that want to take the high set. And uh, they, they will pay the cost. Um, as you can see, cost is the biggest obstacle for high school dropouts. Passing the high set, getting a viable job, and making a better life for themselves means that we are saving Missouri taxpayers millions of dollars that would otherwise go towards social welfare, prisons, or funeral cost. It is estimated that 20,000 students drop out of high school in Missouri each year. It's also estimated that 15,000 students could take this high set test at $95 each, which comes out to be 1.4 million. So this particular bill is subject to appropriations. I knew there was no money to fund the cost of the test. The budget was tight. I just wanted to pass the bill this year and then next year I'll go back and um, uh, try to get the funding or at least part of the funding so uh, because I don't know that 15,000 students are actually going to take it the first year. Um, about three weeks ago I went to the Bonterre prison on a tour with the former governor and some other reps. The Bonterre prison is in my district. So we took this little tour 
and um, the prisoners were on lockdown. And we got to this area right off the gymnasium, and it had about eight to ten computers in there. And then there was a small room that was a library. And the guy that works that room, he was telling us that um, the the students will come in there and they will study for the high set. And I thought, whoa, I can't believe he just said that high set. So anyway, um, I I asked. I said, well how do these kids pay for the high set to take it? And they said they, they only let them take one section at a time, so that would be $7. And he said, we take it out of the till, or I guess out of the money that they have there in the, the, the inmate has in the prison that's you know wanting to take the test. I said, so what's the success rate? And he said, about 94%. And I thought, these are, the, these are the men and women in prison that can see light at the end of the tunnel and they want to turn their life around when they get out of prison and um, try to get a job and um, be able to take care of themselves. Um, last night I was here at the college down at the gym for the graduation for about 12 to 15 students of all ages, men and women, who had passed the high set and they were getting their high school equivalency diploma. I tell you what, as a representative, we go to a lot of events and a lot of cool stuff, but last night was just the coolest. I didn't know any of these students. I couldn't find one person in the crowd that I knew, but those people were so excited for their son, daughter, mother, father, sister, brother that uh, had just passed, um, you know, had, had gotten their diploma last night. So it was, it was pretty cool. Um, this bill had about 20 amendments from the House and Senate attached to it. It looked like a Christmas tree, um, but I told them on the floor that um, I called it a tree with a lot of beautiful gifts under it. All the amendments were very good, uh, and I was happy to allow other legislators in both the House and the Senate to attach their amendments to my bill. And you'll probably hear about some of those amendments this morning. So in closing, it's a, it's a pleasure to uh, uh, serving the state of Missouri in Jefferson City. If ever I can be of any assistance to any of you in this room, uh, please feel free to call me. And um, if you live in my district, I would appreciate your support. Uh, in the upcoming election, I have an opponent in the primary, but I do not have a general. And if uh, you live in my district and you would like a sign in your yard, I can take care of that. <laughs> so, thank you. Thank you, Elaine. And I neglected to mention that uh, Elaine was also honored this year as the uh, alumnus of the year for Jefferson College. So, what a great honor and great recognition. Thank so, you. thank you for all you do for us. Our representative Mike Revis was supposed to be with us this morning. He has been delayed. Should he be able to show up during the program, we'll squeeze him in. But uh, in his absence, we will move on to uh, Representative Becky Ruth. So, Becky. Thank you. First of all, let me say thank you to all of the sponsors. Thank you to the Growth Association. Thank you to uh, KJF Radio for being here um, and for having us out to speak with you all today. Um, Elaine covered a lot of good points. Um, we did get a lot of good legislation done despite all of the other distractions that were going on. Uh, a lot of people said it was probably one of the most successful um, legislatures yet so we were pretty excited at the work that we were able to do the house and the senate worked very well together this year um, despite some absenteeism 
on the executive level. Um, we still kept the machine going and working for the citizens of our state. This year, um, I was pleased to get seven pieces of legislation across the finish line. Um, I always say it's not always as important that your name is on that final bill. Sometimes to get your legislation across the finish line, you have to find other vehicles um, by adding that legislation onto other bills. I did get two of my um, bills signed that I actually sponsored, um, I'm sorry, passed, waiting to be signed. One is going to be signed tomorrow by the governor, so I'll be heading to Jeff City in the morning for that bill signing. Um, two other pieces of legislation that were attached to other uh, bills have already been signed. Uh, one is very important for our area, dealing with our ports. Um, I have been the subcommittee chair for ports uh, for our state, and we've worked very diligently on our AIM zones, the Advanced Industrial Manufacturing Zones, something that Jefferson County is going to be able to take advantage of to help draw more um, manufacturing and different types of work in, within our port zones. Um, one of the things that they kept saying is they needed a definition of what a related industry was that the uh, Department of Economic Development, Department of Revenue could not proceed with the AIM zones until they had that. So we worked very diligently and got that across the finish line. That's already been signed into law. My other bill that was signed into law is a post-traumatic stress awareness day. Some of you are very familiar with PTSD, but there are a lot of people out there that are not. There are a lot of people out there that struggle with this every day, whether it's our veterans, our first responders, or just people in general that have gone through something traumatic. Um, so this would create June 27th as the Post Traumatic Stress Awareness Day in Missouri, and I've already been contacted by many groups that want to start planning activities for that event next year. So bringing about awareness is very, very important. I believe the statistics, and I may get this wrong, but I believe the statistics are on average right now veterans um, are committing suicide on an average of 20 or 22 per day throughout, not just in, in our state, but throughout our country. Um, that's very alarming and a lot of that leading back to PTSD. So the more awareness we can bring about, the more help that we can give those people suffering from that, the better. So that is law and we'll be uh, working towards that next year to plan activities. Um, my bill that's getting signed tomorrow is uh, House Bill 1831. Um, this past year, I started the Jefferson County Diaper Bank. Some of you are familiar with it, some not. I went to a legislative briefing at the St. Louis Area Diaper Bank and saw the work that they were doing there. And I started making phone calls and saying, why doesn't Jefferson County have this? We don't, so I started it. We work with a lot of area agencies. Um, we are a distribution center for diapers. Diapers are something that is not covered under any other plan that they might be getting services for. Diapers is a basic need. A child who is sitting in a wet diaper and crying causes stress on the child for skin rashes, infections, stress on the family. You've got the, the child crying. They're trying to make those diapers last. Um, it's very, very difficult. It's one of those things that, that we need, but it's hard for some people to get. So what the Jefferson County Diaper Bank has done is partnered with groups like St. Louis Crisis Nursery Center, Parents as Teachers, uh, Birthright, Hand in Hand Pregnancy Resource Centers, a lot of the other uh, agencies, and we provide them with diapers. They request them. We do dri diaper drives. So. Um, having this issue of how important diapers are has really come to the forefront um, and it's something like I said very difficult for families so we also made sure that diapers as the Department of Revenue has stated is part of our sales tax holiday that we have in August because many families have to send their children to preschool some are still in diapers or you have those special needs kiddos that are still in diapers that are going to school so the Department of Revenue said yes we recognize it as part of that but it wasn't in statute anywhere. So we put that in statute and the governor is signing that bill tomorrow at 10.30 in the morning. Um, 
Representative Gannon was gracious enough that she also allowed a piece of my legislation on the bill she was just talking about on House Bill 1606. Uh, my very first bill I ever filed was to put a teacher on the State Board of Education. All of our different professional boards we have across the state have active professionals on those boards, but our State Board of Education does not. We had to pare the legislation down quite a bit over time um, to get it through. This person would be an active classroom teacher and they would be a non-voting member. Some people were worried about conflicts of interest and things like that, so we made that person an ex officio non-voting member. Um, having that active classroom teacher there to talk about how those policies that they're, they are adopting are going to actually affect the student in the classroom I think is very valuable. You can't get much better information than the person that's sitting right there in the classroom on the front line that understands what students need or don't need. So having that valuable professional expertise on that state board um, is very much needed. And so that did pass the House and the Senate and it's awaiting the governor's signature. Uh, other legislation that I sponsored this year is we also created the Rare Disease Advisory Council. Um, we found that as the DUR, which is the authority that approves drugs for Medicaid patients um, deal with a lot of these kiddos dealing with rare diseases and they're not really sure what these therapies do or don't do. Uh, most of the people sitting on that DUR are MDs or pharmacists. They don't have a lot of specialty in the rare disease area. So this would create the Rare Disease Advisory Council, which would be made up of specialists that actually are researching and doctors that are dealing with these rare diseases so they can give that information and provide that feedback to that DUR to know how these therapies are going to affect the patients, if they're even good, or not. Sometimes you, you get a therapy and I think a lot of us have taken different prescriptions and find out it doesn't really help. So these folks when we're dealing with rare diseases it's so specialized that we want to make sure we've got the best knowledge out there and we make sure that those patients are getting the best medicines that they can for their disease. Um, my other bill that made it across the finish line um, is the first time home buyer savings account. Many of you may be familiar with the most 529 college savings account plans. This is a savings account plan for first time home buyers. As a realtor, I see day in and day out um, for people that are trying to buy their first home, that's the most difficult thing is to come up with the down payment and closing costs. So this will allow them to set up a savings account. Plus we see a whole generation of millennials coming out that are having a difficult time with saving or moving into that first home. Um, so this hopefully will help with that. It allows a small uh, deduction on your income taxes. So the most you could put in per year is $1,600 for a single individual, $3,200 for married, and then you deduct half of what you put in that year. Um, while it's a small deduction, I think it still helps towards that idea of becoming a first-time home buyer, realizing that American dream. And we all know when home buying is up, it's good for all of our businesses, it's good for our economy. It is average that a first-time home buyer will spend about $10,601 on different things like appliances and repairs, um, building material, floors, furniture, whatever, that first year after they buy a home. So that's $10,601 per person. We have an average of about 28,000 first time home buyers, so kind of do the math there. That's a lot of money, that's about $292 million. When you add the sales tax on top of that, that's another $12 million coming in. So that's going to actually help our economy, help those folks get into a home and, and be able to be a successful um, homeowner. So we're hoping the governor is going to sign that. The other bill that I had this year was the Braille bill. Um, we had a situation where we found a lot of school districts were not teaching children Braille that needed it. Um, some of them can use different sight equipment to help them with reading. However, some of them also have a progressive disease that their vision is only going to continue to get worse. And by the time they become a, an adult and are blind and they haven't learned Braille, it's very difficult for them. So we worked very hard on that bill and that made it across the finish line as well this year. 
Um, let's see if I've left anything off. I think that's all seven of my bills. I'm going to touch on one more thing um, that got passed this year, kind of the last day of the session. We hear a lot about our infrastructure and our roads. That's been something that's been very important to Missourians all the way through. I am the vice chair of the transportation committee, so we've dealt with this a lot. The last day of session, uh, language finally got passed through that would be a gas tax on the ballot for the people to decide on. We are not imposing that. It will be up to the will of the people. It would create a two and a half cent uh, raise in the gas tax for four years. At the end of four years, it would then you'd have the whole total of 10 cents. Currently, our gas tax is only 17 cents and we're one of the lowest in the nation. The national average for um, a gas tax is 24 cents. And this is thought to bring in about $293 million um, for our roads and bridges. So that will be on the ballot in November, and Governor Parson has said he supports getting this done and making sure infrastructure is taken care of. But it ultimately will be up to the people of Missouri. And the very last thing I want to talk about is uh, money for our ports. We got a huge raise for our state ports this year. We got $4.6 million put into capital improvements, and we finally got money put back into the core budget. We got $3 million put back into the core budget for a total of $7.6 million for our ports, which Jefferson County hopefully will be able to take advantage of and keep building on our ports and bringing more economic development into our region. With that, I will close. Thank you. Thank you, Becky. We'll now turn our attention to the Senate. Uh, unfortunately, neither of our uh, senators could be with us uh, today. However, uh, uh, we would like to welcome Mr. Jamie Murphy, who is the aide to Senator Paul Whelan, who will bring us up to speed on some of the activities going on uh, in, in that government body. Jamie? Thank you. Uh, first off, I'd like to thank the Jefferson County Guards Association for putting this on. I apologize that Senator Wheeling could not be here. Uh, it's my fault. I didn't only double book him. I may have triple booked him for this morning. Uh, so you guys do get me. Um, I'm going to try to not uh, touch upon things that we've already heard about, but the legislature this year was very successful. Uh, even though there was turmoil in state government, I would say the House and the Senate worked very well together. Uh, they passed some significant legislation uh, that would allow utility companies to update aging infrastructure. Uh, we passed both corporate and individual tax cuts. Uh, we funded K-12 education at the highest level in state history. Um, and we created access to uh, rural broadband. Um, Senator Whelan uh, is chairman of the Senate Insurance and Banking Committee. So we spend a lot of time in our office addressing the issues uh, that face our banks and insurance companies in the state. Some of the stuff uh, we just have to do. Um, there's some legislation we pass that comes from the uh, regulators, so the uh, NEIC, National Association of Insurance Commissioners. Um, other states pass legislation, and then we have to mirror it so that our companies can work across state lines. Um, so we did things like that. We passed legislation that actually, uh, Senate Bill 981, uh, that lowers the, uh, the rate that our school districts will have to pay, saving public schools $3 million a year uh, for insurance. Um, one of the biggest pieces of legislation we passed was Senate Bill 982, uh, which addressed uh, some major issues within the healthcare industry. So, some of you may have heard, um, I know it was heavily covered in the Post and other news uh, outlets. Um, so one of the nation's largest insurance providers, Anthem, uh, decided that if they didn't like the reason that you went to the emergency room, they weren't going to pay the bill. Uh, so you think you're having a heart attack and you go to the emergency room uh, and they find out that it wasn't a heart attack. So they looked at the final diagnosis and it was something else. Uh, and they said, you know what, that wasn't a good enough reason. You probably should have just gone to your primary care physician. We're not paying that bill. But now what you have is patients having to self-diagnose. Is this really a, a, a appendicitis or is this a cyst? What do I do? Um, and you create a risk there. So we added just eight words to the prudent layperson standard. And the prudent layperson standard essentially says, if you believe that you need 
medical attention than the insurance company has to pay. Uh, so we added language that says they can't look at the final diagnosis. So they can't look at the end result to justify why you went there. Um, so Ameren, you know, started the policy right before session and then magically paused their policy during session because, you know, they didn't want to get the regulators all fired up and then announced right after session that they were going to re-implement it. So uh, it, it turned out to be a really uh, important thing to kind of look at and address. Uh, another part that that bill covered is something called surprise billing. And so surprise billing occurs um, with Mercy. So if you went to a Mercy hospital, for instance, um, they're actually not a bad player in this. We'll pick on somebody else. So if you went on uh, to St. Anthony's, okay, uh, that's another mercy. What is it? They just bought out in Kansas City. If you went somewhere in Kansas City, there we go. We got there. I'll get there. If you went somewhere in Kansas City, for instance, um, and they're in your insurance net provider. Okay, uh, the hospital doesn't necessarily employ that doctor, right? So they subcontract out to that doctor. So even though the hospital you went to is within your insurance network, the doctor that sees you, the radiologist that sees you, uh, they may not actually be in your insurance network. So a lot of you know, especially so there's HMOs and EPO plans don't cover out of network expenses. So if you had those plans, you'd get 100% of the bill. Um, or like my insurance plan, if I go in network, they cover a lot. If I go out of network, they cover very little. Um, so you, the patient who had no say going to the emergency room, who saw you and you thought you did everything right, would still end up getting stuck with a very large medical bill. Um, so that turned out to be a, uh, an issue that we addressed. So we passed a bill that essentially removes the consumer from the equation. And it says, you know what, you did everything right. You're not going to worry about it. We're going to keep the fight between the healthcare providers and the healthcare insurance companies. We're going to give them every opportunity to work the issue out among themselves. Uh, so they have 90 days to negotiate a reimbursement rate. And if they can't figure it out in 90 days, then we send them over to arbitration. Um, and then it's a binding arbitration process set up by the uh, Department of Insurance. But what it really does is it removes the consumer from the equation. Whatever the insurance company and the hospital fight is, fine. Uh, but we made sure to protect you guys um, from that. So that was kind of the kind of our landmark legislation for this year. Um, with that, I think I'll close and uh, not pick on Mercy anymore. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you, Jamie, and we're, we're pleased that uh, Senator Whelan decided to send you out of the office uh, on a temporary basis, not a permanent basis. Depending yeah. on that. If you ever want a tour of the Missouri Senate, Jamie's the guy to go see. He does a great tour. Well, this is the uh, Jefferson County Growth Association Legislative Breakfast being brought to you by uh, uh, KGF Radio, JCTV, and available on our Facebook page and I believe streaming on KGF as well. So uh, you have lots of opportunities. If uh, you're missing, if you missed it live, you can still catch us up uh, down the road. Our sponsors for this morning are Govero Land Services, Comtree, Dobbs Tire and Auto, Mercy Jefferson, St. Paul GM Power, Ameren, Customer Insurance Services, Debbie Dunnigan, Recorder of Deeds, Firework City, and Sheet Metal Workers Local 36. We appreciate their support. Well, now it's an opportunity to turn to the, uh, to the federal scene. And we uh, have with us today several staff representatives from our national office holders. And I'll ask them to come forward and give us a brief update on what's going on in Washington, D.C. So we will start today with a representative from Roy Blunt's office, Jennifer Hoskins. Jennifer? Hello, good morning. Um, thank you for allowing me to be here today. The senator is in Washington, D.C., so I'm sorry you have me. So, <laughs> um, as uh, Dr. Kmenzi mentioned, I'm Jennifer Hoskins, and I cover Jefferson County for the senator um, in the St. Louis region. I also cover um, environmental issues, transportation issues, river issues. I've been working closely um, with the Jefferson County Port Authority, so uh, happy to be here today. A few of the things, just so you're aware of, uh, the committees that the senator uh, serves on, he serves on the Appropriations Committee. He also serves on the Committee of Commerce, Science, and Transportation. He is the chairman of the Committee on Rules. So if you saw him um, at the inauguration, that was part of his duties. So um, as the Rules Committee, he's also on the Select Committee on Intelligence. So um, he has a lot on his plate, <laughs> a lot going on right now. Um, one of the things that we're wor working on is uh, the Water Resource Development Act. And just a few of the, um, 
priorities. This is in all of them for Missouri, but just a few things that I wanted to touch on. He is working to get the St. Louis Riverfront and Merrimack River Basin study, um, which adds flood control as a study purpose to allow the Corps to explore options to control flooding in the St. Louis region, which I know um, has unfortunately touched Jefferson County um, several times in the last couple years. He also um, has included language which advances the Navigation and Ecosystem Stability Act program. So what that will do is it will authorize uh, the modernization of seven locks and dams on the Upper Mississippi. So I know we're not on the Upper Mississippi, but it will also, uh, that's going to go downstream too as well and affect, you know, what can come in and out. And that's definitely important for our commerce on the river. Also, it provides uh, part of the Water Resource Development Act. It would, the community that we're working on is the community, community affordability guidance for water systems. So what that would do is it would require the EPA to issue new guidance on how they determine affordability for water systems. Uh, Senator Blunt, so as he is the chairman on the Appropriations Subcommittee for Labor, Health, Human Services, Education, Related Agencies, and um, so that's, I know, a long time, but that includes a lot of things. He has led efforts to increase funding for education, behavioral health, and health research programs. Um, the senator is a former... Uh, college president, so he definitely understands the challenges that uh, that educators face. So one of the things, as chairman of the subcommittee, it funds the Department of Education, um, which leads to increase the maximum Pell Grants awards uh, to $6,995. It's a 3% increase, which makes college more affordable for um, 1,300 students in Missouri colleges and universities who receive Pell Grants. Also, one thing that he's worked on for the past is also year-round funding for Pell Grants. So before, um, you weren't able to get Pell Grants during the summer, which a lot of students do go year-round. So he also worked on that. He has also led efforts in Congress to improve and expand access to quality mental health treatment. A few weeks ago, he was at Comtree and heard from um, folks there. I think that there was a very good discussion. I think they're on the same page of what's happening here in Jefferson County. We're, uh, so as chairman of the subcommittee that funds the Department of Health and Human Services, he increased hun funding for mental health programs by $306 million in this um, year's government funding bill. It included $160 million for mental health block grant and $100 million for new program targeted at certified community health behavior clinics whose sole purpose is to expand access to comprehensive health services. Uh, I think it's pretty alarming whenever uh, we were at Comptree, just the number of cases that are, they are seeing, for instance, with the opioid abuse. And I know, I think I heard today that it was, uh, don't, I'm not 100% sure there. I think it's up to like 175 um, Americans are dying daily from the opioid epidemic. So this year, his Senator Blunt subcommittee secured 2.5 billion increase in the government funding bill for health-related programs to targeting the opioid epidemic. And uh, believe me, but from that uh, meeting with Comtree, it's it's definitely hitting home. Um, it's it's right here, unfortunately. Um, Senator Blunt has also, he is chairman of the subcommittee that funds the National Institutes of Health. So he has worked to increase funding by a total of $7 billion, or 23% over the last three years. Um, it provides $3.7 billion for NHS, $3 billion increase over last year's level. Um, in 2017, Missouri re received $537.5 million in grant funding, supporting 7,569 jobs and one point three billion in economic activity. Um, also included that was Alzheimer's research. Um, unfortunately, that's another thing that's affecting a lot of people. The bill included 1.8 billion for Alzheimer's research. Um, he's also, Senator Blunt is committed to advancing pro-growth policies that help create jobs um, and grow the economy. So just a few things that uh, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, and I'm not gonna go to, into everything, but it doubled the standard uh, deduction so that will reduce or eliminate the federal income tax burden on tens of millions of Americans family. It eliminates the individual tax mandate and it creates well, another thing that it creates 161 opportunity zones in Missouri which are high areas of poverty rates and slow job growth and I know uh, this is happening right here this in our uh, in your neighbors in Warren County I know there's a program that is using this already in Truesdale, Missouri. He's also committed to repealing unnecessarily regulations, and he has 
one of his major accomplishments under this administration has been rolling back red tape. He has, the Senate has used the Congressional Review Act to block 15 major new rules that would cost the economy up to $36 billion in, compl or in compliance costs. So, uh, you know, we're look, although we're, you know, some programs are added, we're also looking at some things that are not working and how can we, uh, how can that help you in Missouri? He's also committed to making sure that Missouri veterans across the nation are receiving the care benefits and support they receive. I think that I've talked about this before, but uh, Senator Blunt's bipartisan measure, the Higher Veterans Act, establishes a recognition program for the Department of Labor to award employers based on their contributions to the veteran employment. And this year, we've already seen 300 employees that are 300 employers that have used that program as well. Um, and I just want to add too, if, if you know you're hearing something that a program maybe that you can use as a business owner, please feel free to reach out to me if you have a success story. I think that that's always helpful to hear because, um, you know, the senator can talk about it, but if we have those real life examples or if there's ways to, you know, better a program, then please, please let me know. Um, you know, you may not think that it matters, but it certainly does matter. Senator Blunt also um, had a law signed into law for in December 2017, which is the Military Family Stability Act, and it basically uh, it allows more flexibility for when military families are moving. So, um, as some of you may be military m members, you know that um, when they have to move, it doesn't just affect them; it also affects um, the whole family. So that allows for more flexibility. And I have a few more things. <laughs> Almost done. Um, he also, uh, in the ag priorities in the agriculture appropriations bill, uh, Senator Blunt also worked for water and electric infrastructure. It includes 1.25 billion for USDA water and waste grants loans, and also he has worked on rural broadband issues, which um, I know I've heard from some of you in this room about the issues that um, you have in some of the rural parts of Jefferson County. So. We are definitely looking at those issues. Thank you for letting me be here. I think Jim McNichol is going to get the shepherd's crook out. And I'm just kidding. Uh, you know, we mentioned it with the, with the state legislators. I do want to add that our, our federal legislators also do a great job of coming together to work on, on behalf of Jefferson County, no matter which side of the aisle they, they, they land on. So we appreciate that. All right, next up, uh, representing Senator Claire McCaskill's office is Brendan Fahey. Brendan. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kaminsky. And uh, thank you, Jefferson County Growth Association, for inviting us out to uh, address the crowd uh, about the legislative uh, agenda and what's going been going on in uh, uh, Washington, D.C. I also want to thank Jennifer for taking up some time so I don't have to talk as long. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's always good. So, uh, Senator McCaskill uh, sends her regrets for not being able to come out. She's uh, in Washington uh, while the Senate's in session, but she did want me to say uh, uh, thank you for uh, attending and to listening to the agenda of what's going on. Uh, Senator McCaskill sits on three committees. She's on the Armed Services, Finance, and then she's the ranking member on Homeland Security and Government Affairs, which means she's the highest ranking Democrat on that committee. And she works closely with the chairman in uh, setting the agenda for that uh, kind of topic. So a little bit of what I would like to discuss uh, this morning is I'm going to give kind of broad overviews of what we're going to, uh, what she's been working on. So they're not going to be in too much details and so forth, but I'll give you kind of a general overview of what Senator McCaskill has been uh, trying to focus on. Uh, you know, uh, uh, so it's going to be in three areas from uh, working, working for Missourians, her uh, town halls that she's been hosting uh, throughout the state for the last year and a half, and then also uh, just her independent voice. Uh, Senator McCaskill has uh, been uh, uh, doing a number of things. Uh, one has been taking on pharmaceutical companies in her fight against rising prescription drug prices for Missourians. Uh, she has uh, slammed the influence of pharmaceutical companies in Congress, noting that while pharmaceutical companies receive billions of dollars in windfill and windfalls from uh, the Republican tax plan, uh, not one single uh, uh, pharmaceutical company announced a decrease in the prices for drugs. And uh, due to this, she introduced legislation to end, to end the taxpayer subsidies uh, for pharmaceutical companies to receive the billions of dollars they spend on prescription drug advertising as a result. 
She's also currently engaged in one of the most comprehensive congressional investigations into the opioid crisis to date. She's introduced uh, legislation to reduce the overprescription of opioids, provide additional resources for the uh, pre prescription drug monitoring programs, and crack down on the illegal importation of fentanyl uh, that's coming from overseas. Uh, just also uh, piggyback for what Jamie was saying about uh, Missouri legislation. Uh, Senator McCaskill has also been quite concerned with the uh, health care costs uh, that are facing Missourians. She's demanding answers and called for a full review of actions from the health insurer anthem to deny emergency room coverage for Missourians care that is deemed non-emergent, a potential violation of consumer rights and federal law. She's also uh, looked into the staggering air ambulance bills. Uh, introduced the stat or air or ambulance bills that Missourians are receiving, and she's called for greater uh, uh, transparency and consumer protections to the air ambulance in industry, allowing states to better regulate the medical costs association with the air ambulance services. Uh, she's also been uh, looking after reports from uh, uh, out in rural uh, Missouri with Putnam County Memorial and the billing project uh, practices of fraudulent practices. Claire's has introduced. Uh, has called for federal investigation in, uh, to examine billing practices. And then also one of the other longtime uh, advocates of uh, veterans, uh, she's uh, uh, just last month she uh, released her uh, fifth, uh, well, her seventh report of uh, consumers, uh, veterans cons consumer uh, Customer Satisfaction Program, which uh, basically is where uh, the veterans can secret shopper, uh, do a secret shopper program and rate the quality of service that veterans receive at any VA medical center. And uh, she introduced, or she released the, the re this year's report that uh, showed a steady increase of the quality of service that veterans are receiving in all the VA facilities throughout the state. And then she's also was a bipartisan uh, supporter of the VA Mission Act, uh, which had basically streamlined and gave more access to the VA to uh, uh, streamline the quality of services that veterans are receiving at uh, their uh, local facilities and so forth. Uh, the, the other area that I would like to, to touch a base on is uh, Senator McCaskill. Uh, over the last uh, year and a half, Senator McCaskill has hosted 52 uh, town halls throughout the state of Missouri, where she went from uh, any small town to big city and listened to the concerns that Missourians are having. And it didn't matter if uh, Missourians wanted to chew on her ear or give her suggestion. She thought it was a vital uh, uh, part of her job, just listening to uh, Missourians and getting their feedback to make uh, strong recommendations for how to move our country forward and so forth. And then uh, the last area that I'd just like to touch base is uh, Senator McCaskill's independent voice. Uh, you know, Senator McCaskill uh, prides herself as being one of the most bipartisan uh, senators in the state, in the country, where she will work across the line with uh, Senator Blunt to move agendas for Missourians. If that's anywhere from the Delta Queen legislation that they uh, Senate passed to uh, improving flood uh, legislation for uh, our roads and bridges with uh, FEMA. So those are just a little bit of what Senator McCaskill has been working on. And with that, I will turn it over. Okay. All right, very good. Well, we'll now turn our attention to the House, and we will first invite rep representative for Representative Ann Wagner, Jackie Winship. Jackie? Thank you all. Thank you uh, to the college and to Jefferson County Growth Association, to everyone. Um, good morning. Uh, thank you all. Um, I'm going to try to just touch on a few things. Um, where I want to start, because I don't want to assume that you know um, Congresswoman Wagner well, uh, Jefferson County does have three members of Congress representing us, representing all of you. I think that's an advantage. Some people don't. You get three of us working on behalf of issues like the Delta Queen, the ports, infrastructure, flooding, and we do all work together very closely, both on the Senate and the House side on these issues on behalf of Jefferson County. Uh, the second congressional district um, has Arnold and some of that unincorporated northern Jefferson County. 
Uh, it's a fairly small part of the whole second district, but the congresswoman considers it very important and has spent quite a bit of time. We also have spent time at Comtree um, with the college on their workforce development, um, learning a lot about that part, the apprenticeship programs and partnership, uh, a number of the industries in Arnold, and then uh, a lot of the countywide uh, uh, events. So we do consider this a very important uh, county with a lot going on. A lot of people cover things, so I'm going to try to cover um, a couple of things about the Congresswoman and some of the, her passionate areas. Uh, you can't be all things to all people in Congress. It's big. It's complicated. Uh, she's tried to focus where she believes she has been called to and be effective. Uh, she has served since uh, entering Congress in 2013 on the Financial Services Committee and currently chairs the Oversight and Investigative Subcommittee of the Financial Services Committee. And she also started this session serving on foreign affairs as well. She is a former uh, U.S. Ambassador to Luxembourg, so foreign affairs um, is a pretty important place where her voice can, can add value. And she is a senior deputy whip. She has been very passionate uh, from the very beginning about fighting sex trafficking and, and all forms of human trafficking. But here in the St. Louis region, we are one of the top 20 locations for sex trafficking. And so she has had, uh, a couple years ago, the SAVE Act passed, uh, which made it um, illegal to uh, advertise tra victims trafficking ran into some issues trying when people tried to take that uh, into the courts and use it. Uh, and so uh, found there's a section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, which is an old piece of law, law from the 1960s before everything was online that needed to be updated. Uh, and so just this spring, um, FOSTA, her bill, um, was signed into law. Um, it's a long title, allow states and, let me see, allow states and victims to fight online sex trafficking act. Um, it was signed into law on um, April 11th, and this is considered the most revolutionary anti-trafficking legislation since, uh, for at least 20 years. Uh, it has decreased uh, the online advertising for sex traffic, for sex ads by about 80 percent. Um, it shut down Backpage.com, which was making millions of dollars a month on trafficking ads. Uh, and really, a lot of ads and a lot of websites you wouldn't even have heard of. So, uh, and it now allows um, for prosecution and for victims to go after these sites um, and get restitution. So, um, it's a pretty big deal and we've been pretty proud. It took a lot of years and a lot of work um, to do that. The other area where she's been um, very active is in some of the financial services areas. Um, bills that don't sound very exciting maybe, but um, things like um, reform, oh, one area too, the ref uh, this bill passed out of committee recently is the Reforming Disaster Recovery Act of 2017. Um, and this would change how the Community Development Block Grant Disaster Recovery Program works uh, to make it more effective uh, so that taxpayer-funded dis uh, disaster relief dollars are spent more effectively. This really is something that has come out of what we've seen in the flooding, the Merrimack and that, and our experience with our communities along there. Um, this bill, like I said, passed out of committee, so we're hopeful. And you know, it takes. I, I have to just t share with you that there's always this. There's this old song that always goes through my head. There's. Uh, I've changed the words though to from the, the original to. There's 50 ways to kill a bill. <laughs> it's, it's a lot harder to pass good legislation than you might think. Um, so some of her other uh, pieces of legislation she introduced recently, Taxpayer Identity Theft Protection Act, Risk-Based Credit Examination Act, a lot of these things come out of the work that she does in her committee in financial services. Um, 
So those are some of the areas. Of, she has a number of, of anti-trafficking bills. She is always a co-sponsor and considered a lead uh, person in, in battling that. Both here in the community, we do a lot of that work, and in Congress. So um, it's a pleasure to be here, and I'll be around afterwards if you have any other specific questions or if I can get you any other information. Thank you. Just had another one of those realizations. I don't think of Paul Simon's albums as being that old. So what's that tell you? <laughs> I think it says something about me. We won't go there. Uh, next up, representing uh, Representative Jason Smith's office is Donna Hickman. Donna? Thank you. It is always a pleasure to be here on behalf of the congressman in uh, Jefferson County, representing the 8th Congressional District, which is mostly the southernmost part of Jefferson County. As a member of the House Ways and Means Committee, Congressman Smith was among the authors of the new tax code passed by Congress and signed by President Trump. And most recently, Congressman Smith introduced H.R. 5903, the Permanent Tax Relief for Working Families Act. This legislation makes permanent the new and expanded per-child tax credit established under the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. With its lower rates, doubling of the standard deduction, and a doubling of the per-child tax credit, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act was a huge win for the families of Southern Missouri. Congressman Smith received the Spirit of Enterprise Award from the U.S. Chamber of Commerce for his strong record of fighting for small businesses, cutting taxes, and encouraging job growth. Congressman Smith voted in favor of H.R. 5515, National Defense Authorization Act for fiscal year 2019. It provides our troops with the largest pay raise in nine years. Congressman Smith authored and introduced the Upward Mobility Enhancement Act that allows employers to offer tax-free education assistance of up to $11,500 a year to their employees. The bill is under consideration by the Senate Finance Committee. The Environmental Protection Agency enacted Mr. Smith's Taxpayer Protection Agent legislation passed by the House last September. The EPA issued a directive that removes the incentive for outside groups to sue the federal government. It bars the government from paying attorney fees in any environmental law case arising under the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, or the Endangered Species Act. The Congressman has worked to ensure the Corps of Engineers is being responsive to the citizens of DeSoto impacted by flooding along the Joachim Creek. While not in his district, Congressman Smith is very supportive of efforts to uh, allow the Delta Queen to make her home at the Jefferson County Port and has supported those ongoing issues and efforts. Congressman Smith sponsored the bill to create a national park down the road on, uh, in St. Genevieve and Congress approved it and work is currently underway there to make that happen. In the days ahead, the Congressman is looking at work requirements to allow people to receive welfare benefits. And in this way, the government would encourage people to find work rather than empower them to continually stay reliant on the government. He is a member of the House Ways and Means Committee, which handles all revenue coming into the United States, and is a member of the Budget Committee. He is the youngest member of elected House leadership and has traveled with President Trump in his visits to Missouri, showing him the needs of rural Missouri in terms of tax relief. It is always our pleasure to update you on the Congressman's activities, and we would encourage any of our Jefferson County constituents with questions or concerns or problems with federal agencies to contact our Farmington office, and I have cards here today to give you. Thank you. All right, as we near the, the end of our program today, I do want to take a moment one more time to recognize our sponsors, Sheet Metal Workers Local 36, Fireworks City, Debbie Dunnigan, Recorder of Deeds, Custom Insurance Services, Ameren, St. Paul GM Power, Mercy Jefferson, Dobbs Tire and Auto, Comtree, and Govero Land Services. And now last, but certainly not least, representing uh, Representative Luke Meyer's office, uh, please welcome Jim McNichols. Thank you, Jim. You have a couple of say, say the best for last, right, Ray? No. Okay. <laughs> The blessing and the curse of going last is you get to check a bunch of stuff off your list. Uh, so uh, my name is Jim McNichols. Um, 
I represent Congressman Blaine Luttemeyer. I work out of his Washington, Missouri district office, and I have Jefferson and Franklin counties. Our district represents kind of the middle part of Jefferson County, so everything south of basically Arnold and Imperial, all the way down to Crystal City, then over to House Springs, High Ridge, those areas, Dittmer, Big uh, Cedar Hill over there, that area over there. And uh, Congressman Luttemeyer feels very blessed to be able to uh, represent those constituents. Um, Quick fact I want to leave with everybody. Um, you know, we talked earlier about the fact that this was one of the most productive sessions of the General Assembly in Jefferson City in a long time. Um, a, a little uh, note to keep in mind, the House of Representatives uh, has passed over 600 bills this session of Congress and sent them over to the, to the Senate. Now, 450 of those are still sitting in the Senate, but... Uh, <laughs> They, uh, it, it's been a very productive session for us. Uh, for those who don't know, the congressman is uh, a member of the Financial Services Committee. He's the chairman of the uh, Subcommittee on Financial Institutions and Consumer Credit. He's also the vice chairman of the Small Business Committee. So banking issues, small business issues, those types of things are very important to him. Um, we had a large hand in the recent passage of the uh, uh, S2155, which is the uh, joint banking bill that they passed um, dealing with regulatory relief from some of the owner's provisions of Dodd-Frank having to do with especially community banking uh, and credit unions and those kinds of things. Um, so we were very happy to have a lot of provisions that we have been pushing personally um, in that regard on that bill. A uh, couple things I wanted to highlight and kind of uh, that, that other people had mentioned and talk a little bit more about. Um, in terms of defense spending, uh, just, a, just a little note for folks, um, in terms of the amount of spending that Congress has uh, increased going to, to DOD, we have increased between last year's authorization and what is, is in the process of being finalized this year, over $1.2 trillion in new spending including, uh, when it's all said and done, uh, a pay increase for our troops of 5%, which I think is very important. And in addition to that, specifically for Missouri, and this is, uh, I give a lot of credit to Congresswoman Wagner, um, an increase, I believe, of 24 new FA-18s, which support approximately 13,000 jobs in the St. Louis metropolitan region, which is very important. Um, the other things that I wanted to talk about, um, in terms of uh, opioids, I think it's very important to highlight the leadership both of Senator McCaskill and Senator Blunt in terms of pushing this issue through in terms of the increase of the money going to NIH and in just in terms of putting money into this critical crisis that we are facing. It's affecting everybody, rural, urban, suburban, black, white, brown, doesn't matter. Everybody's feeling the effects of this, and for us to be able to have folks like these, these two great senators that are leading this effort on a national level is very important. Um, <clears throat> as a representative of a district that has, I believe, the most river frontage in the entire country, I think it's very important to talk about the increase in the Corps of Engineers funding that has been, uh, that has been provided. Uh, the last omnibus bill that was passed and signed by President Trump provided an increase of almost $800 million to the Corps, uh, including $200 million that goes into its construction account, which deals with levees, uh, all manner, uh, we talked about blocks and dams, those kinds of things, um, including, and we mentioned this with DeSoto, um, an increase of $215 million for flood and storm damage reduction projects and $224 million above and beyond the budget request for construction for the Inland Waterways Trust Fund. Um, we talked about rural broadband a little bit ago, um, and I have talked with several folks who work in this, this field, and, and kind of, I know there's been a lot of frustration about why we can't get rural broadband money to come into the state, and I think for Jefferson County in particular, the issue becomes uh, we're kind of in a gray area because we're a county that has a population that is too big to be deemed a rural county, yet too small to be deemed a county where they would come in and make the kind of investment that they need to in terms of the telecommunications company. So we're going to keep working on that, uh, try and see if we can jigger with the 
definitions and the population and those kinds of things uh, because that also affects our ability to apply for money in terms of uh, in, with a lot of the transportation dollars now they're, they're making a designation about money going to rural counties versus all other counties so we're going to keep working on that but um, again I, I appreciate all of the sponsors sponsoring this and, and Ray and uh, I will be around afterwards to answer any questions. Thanks guys. Well, as you can see, it's been a very busy and hectic year, and uh, the work goes on. So uh, we appreciate you being here uh, today. I want to remind you the Growth Association will be sponsoring legislative forums this fall for candidates who run for office. Uh, for those of you who are listening to KJFF, we appreciate you tuning in this morning on JCTV or on the web. We appreciate your interest in what's going on for those who uh, spend a lot of time and effort to serve the citizens of Jefferson County. Thank you for being here this morning, and have a great day.